Hi, and welcome to this Open Source Summit North America presentation on compare, contrast, and contribute to model deployment standards and how you can help. I'm Nick Pentreath. I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a principal engineer working at IBM's Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, where I work on machine learning and AI open source software. I'm an Apache Spark Committee and PMC member and author of Machine Learning with Spark. Joining me today is my colleague Svetlana. Hello, everyone. I'm Svetlana Levitan. I, I was a senior soft, sorry, developer advocate, and very soon I will be open for new opportunities. And I've been working on PMML for many years, and today I'll be happy to tell you about it. And recently I also work on Onyx. Thank you. Uh, so before we start, a little bit about CODE, or the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. We're a team of over 30 open source developers within IBM working on the enterprise AI lifecycle in open source. We advocate for and contribute to projects that are critical to IBM's data and AI offerings. And this, this includes the Python data science stack, open exchanges for uh, data and deep learning models, deep learning and machine learning frameworks. Apache Spark is a big part of that, as well as AI ethics libraries and what we'll be talking about today, which is model deployment and standards for deploying models. So we'll start with uh, a discussion of why we need open standards for model deployment, and then walk through three commonly used and widely applied standards for machine learning serialization. Uh, and then we'll uh, walk through a feature comparison of them um, and wrap up with ways that you can actually contribute to these open source projects. So we'll start with the machine learning workflow, which starts with data. We then analyze that data, and typically data doesn't arrive in a format that is amenable to machine learning. Uh, it doesn't arrive neatly packaged up as vectors and tensors and, and whatnot. So we then need to transform that data, pre-process it, extract features, and convert it into a form that is amenable to feeding into a machine learning algorithm. We then train a, a model, and once we have a trained model, there's not much uh, point in not actually deploying that model, we need to actually use it in the real world um, to do something useful. So the next step is to deploy the model um, and use it to predict on new data in a live environment. Uh, we then need to maintain the model and monitor it and ensure it remains doing the job that we wanted it to do. And then new data arrives as part of this process. And in some cases, the model is actually uh, generating its new data. And that really closes this, this workflow, turns it back into a loop. So the workflow spans teams. Uh, the data side is the, the domain of our data engineers who are responsible for storing, securing data, and providing access to the data to machine learning researchers and data scientists who take the data into their data science workflow of anal analyzing, pre-processing, training models. And typically, once a model is trained, it's often thrown over the wall to the production engineer and machine learning engineer. And they're responsible for model deployments and for monitoring and maintaining that model. And the workflow also spans tools. So for each of these phases, there are many, many different tools, uh, various data formats, various ways of analyzing and visualizing data, various uh, frameworks and toolkits for creating machine learning pipelines and pre-processing steps, as well as training models and finally for deployment. And in any even small to medium size, but certainly large size uh, machine learning and data science team, you will pretty much be using almost all of these uh, frameworks and tools. And you're required to actually support almost all of them, uh, both for training and for deployment. So if we think about model deployment, uh, we need to really think about three questions, uh, the what, the where, and the how. And today we'll mostly be talking about the what, which is probably the most critical of these. So the what really refers to what do we mean by a model? Uh, when people talk about model, often they're talking about a trained algorithm, uh, a, a machine learning model that's been trained on data and a set of weights that go with that. But in fact, there's a whole uh, process as we've seen that comes before training the model. So we need to take that data, transform it, we need to extract features, we need to pre-process those features, and then, only then can we train the model. And at prediction, we need to perform the exact same steps in exactly the same order. 
So we still need to apply the same transformations, feature extraction and pre-processing before we can make a prediction. And if we don't uh, use exactly the same steps, then we're going to end up with a situation where we have a model skew um, and we get effectively garbage results on um, at prediction time. So as we've seen, we actually need to think about deploying full pipelines and not just model. Uh, we need to deploy the data transform, the feature extraction and pre-processing steps, of course, the machine learning or deep learning model itself. And finally, something that's actually, actually often overlooked, we need to deploy the prediction transformation um, and post-processing that occurs after model inference. And if we think about this, even actually uh, ETL and, and the, the data steps and, and in some cases, SQL style operations are in fact part of the pipeline because they feed the, the raw data and the features that we are using. So we've seen so that there are many challenges uh, involved. We need to manage and bridge all these languages, frameworks, dependencies, versions, and performance can vary a lot along these dimensions. So if we have a, a model in R or Python, that could be very performance if perhaps it's written in an underlying C engine or TensorFlow or PyTorch or something, or it could be very not performant um, and we could have an issue there. And we actually, we don't really know um, just because of it's written in Python or R or whatever the language is uh, or the framework, um, up, you know, updating versions can, can have an impact on performance and all of these uh, situations. And we also have friction between these teams of data scientists, machine learning engineers, um, and the business side. And we need to bridge all of these gaps between these organizational uh, silos and teams. Each of these frameworks that we need to support tends to do uh, its own thing in terms of exporting models and, and formats. And for even for open source uh, frameworks, while you can have a look at what the format is, it tends to be um, very different from e each other. And this inevitably leads to many custom solutions and extensions. So to address this challenge, if we can standardize the formats, um, then it allows us to take all of these different frameworks and toolkits, export them to one standard format. And once we've done that, we have the benefit of being able to optimize across a single stack. So we have a separation of concerns between the model producer and the model consumer. The model producer coming from one of these machine learning frameworks or deep learning frameworks doesn't need to care where the model is going to be deployed. All it needs to care about is exporting to a standard format. And likewise, when we're executing or deploying in our production engine, uh, all we need to, to care about is that we are taking in a, a, a correctly formatted uh, model in the standard format. We don't have to worry about where it came from. And then once we have a, a single stack in the standard format, we can optimize the performance of that single stack. So it's great uh, that we can have a standard um, and ideally that would be open source, uh, but there's a difference between kind of open source and open governance. The open source license is only one aspect. Of course, we want a, a permissive open source license that allows us to uh, inspect the code, modify the code, use it in any way we want. But we often may not have control. So even though it's open source on GitHub doesn't mean that it is um, it is completely open in, in, this, in the sense that we can exert some control over the decisions that happen uh, in that project. So open governance is really critical. Uh, that it avoids concentration of control in the hands of a few large vendors or companies, gives you clear visibility into the development process, how decisions are made, uh, strategic roadmaps and, and plans for the, for the future. Of course, there are downsides to a standard. Um, it needs a kind of critical mass and adoption to succeed. And it, things can move slowly and you might have a design by committee um, issue here. But overall, open governance and an open standard uh, has brings far more benefit than these downsides. So next, I'm going to hand over to Svetlana, who will talk through the first of our three um, model deployment set standards. Thank you, Nick. Yes, so let me talk, tell you about PMML. Um, so back in the 1990s, um, some people realized that uh, there are challenges with model deployment and uh, the, data, the data mining group was created. Uh, data mining group is a group of companies working together on the open standard for machine learning model deployment. 
Uh, so, uh, and the first such standard uh, that came out of data mining group was PMML, predictive model markup language. It was using XML format because that's what was a popular format in the 90s. And uh, since uh, that time, it has grown a lot. And um, many uh, people from different companies work together on this um, standard. Uh, just this month, we released uh, version 4.4.1. And it has 17 different uh, statistical and machine learning models, plus uh, many ways to co uh, combine models together with ensembles, uh, compositions, and uh, a lot of uh, support for data transformations. And I've been fortunate to work with PML for many years and uh, le leading the uh, recent releases of PMML. So what is PMML? How does a PML document look like? It is an XML document with PML as a root element. And inside, you can find um, the header, the data dictionary, transformation dictionary, which is optional, and uh, one or more models. And then, uh, well, the header would describe what your application was, uh, copyright, etc. And uh, the data dictionary would describe your data, which must be uh, structured data. And then, of course, transformation dictionary would describe data transformations, and uh, the models would uh, describe the models. And inside each of the models, you can find uh, several different uh, elements. Uh, mining schema is a required element. This thing does not want to advance for me. Uh, OK. Um, and uh, sorry. Yes, so mining scheme is required. It tells us what are predictors, what is the target. And then uh, outputs uh, can describe post, uh, post transformations of the data, uh, of the predictions. And uh, there are several other optional elements that are very useful in many cases. And here we have uh, an example of a logistic regression model PMML, which uh, Uh, which uh, is which shows you uh, that uh, yes there is a header data dictionary and then uh, the regression model is uh, described by uh, by the regression uh, model element and uh, there are uh, coefficients uh, and uh, other information necessary for scoring the model in general uh, there are 17 models as i mentioned in the latest releases of pml in 4.4 release, which came out last year, we added anomaly detection, and we added uh, sufficient, uh, quite a lot of information to a time series model that previously was only for uh, exponential smoothing. And mining model provides ways to combine different models together into ensembles and model compositions. And here you can see a list of companies or open source packages that support uh, PMML. Uh, this list is taken from the DMG website, where you can find all the information about PML. At IBM, we have a number of uh, products that support uh, PML standard pretty well. And uh, you can see uh, here pictures of IBM SPSS statistics, uh, which, uh, by the way, recently released, uh, released 27, and uh, IBM SPSS modeler. And you can export PML from many models in those products, and you can also score PML in those products. And in open source, there is a JPML package uh, maintained by Willow Rusman from Estonia. Uh, it uh, has support for PML export for many different uh, open source frameworks, as well as uh, some support for scoring, but that is mostly paid. And uh, there is also Nioka package for SkyKit Learn, and there is R package PMML. And um, for scoring PMML, there are open packages um, PML4S, which is in Scala and has Java API. And PyPML is a wrapper for Python for that package. And um, here I wanted to tell you one short example of practical applications of PMML. Uh, so there was this. Um, uh, big insurance company that built an 
a random forest model in R, and they wanted to use a very efficient in database scoring with modeler. And uh, thanks to PML, uh, we were able to do it very successfully. And now back to Nick with the next format. So the, the next format we'll talk about is the portable format for analytics, or PFA. Now, uh, we see previously the data mining group released uh, PMML, uh, PMML, which was uh, very uh, widely adopted. Um, but certainly had some, um, some issues in terms of flexibility. Uh, so if essentially if whatever you wanted to represent in terms of the model or the data transform was not part of the PMML standard, uh, there, there was not much way around that apart from creating a, a custom extension. Um, but, but unfortunately, once you do that, you lose the benefit of the standard because a scoring engine may not be aware of your custom extension. So PFA was also created by the data mining group in an attempt to overcome this challenge. Uh, so PFA at its heart uh, uses a JSON format as opposed to XML and specifies the data types uh, for inputs and outputs, um, as well as the function uh, arguments uh, using Avro. So you can think of PFA as a type of um, mini functional math language uh, plus a schema specification. So the idea is to provide a lot more flexibility um, and to be able to effectively represent almost any uh, analytic transform model or pre-processing step in, in PFA um, using essentially uh, programming language constructs. So let's take a simple example, um, as we saw before, of logistic regression. So here we take a, an input vector x and we want to apply a function on that input vector to get an output, uh, which is going to be our, our prediction. Now in, in PFA, uh, we, sp we split up the, uh, the computation into the, these um, various cells that we see here. So the input is specified as a, as a vector or an array. We then have something called a cell in PFA, and a cell is the way to represent uh, data. Um, so any model weights uh, or you know, dictionaries mapping from, um, from terms or words to indexes and things like that that we want to use in our, in our model or our pipeline are represented in a cell. And here we have a, a model cell which has the parameters which has our weight vector and our bias vector for our linear model. We then apply a function to the input and the model cell. And a function is, is built into PFA as a linear model function. We then apply another function softmax to the result, and then we apply an argmax function, and we get an output, which is uh, the predicted class. So if we look at how that might be represented in PFA, we can see on the left here that we have a very simple representation of a PFA document, which is a JSON, uh, a JSON object. And we specify the inputs and outputs using Avro schemas. So the input is an array type uh, with, with double uh, contents and the output is a double and on the right we specify what is known as an action to perform so the action is what we saw is the is the set of functions that we applied to the input in order to get the output so here we start from the inside and work our way outwards and we, the first function we apply is the linear model function model dot reg for regression dot linear and that takes two arguments the first is the input which we saw is is this vector this uh, double array and the second is that cell, that model cell, which has uh, containing the weights and the bias. To the output of that function, we then apply our softmax function, and then finally our argmax, fu argmax, argmax function. So as we saw in the previous slide, uh, that, that, that flow is exactly what's being rep represented here in JSON. There's some other features of PFA. It supports uh, control, control structures such as conditionals and, and various types of looping. Uh, you can create and manipulate local variables as well as uh, very arbitrary user-defined functions, including anonymous functions, i.e. lambdas. Uh, you can cast between types, perform null checks, and do some very basic error handling. And there's a very comprehensive built-in function library. So the basics uh, types and, and, and manipulation of those types, including numbers and numerical math uh, functions, uh, string processing, array and map functions, statistical functions, as well as linear algebra, um, and good built-in support for various uh, traditional machine learning models, such as linear models, clustering, uh, decision trees. Uh, 
out in open source, uh, there's been quite a lot of interest in PFA and, and it has been taken up by a few companies. The original reference implementation was created by the Open Data Group, uh, and that is called Hadrian. PFA scoring in Uh, there was not much uh, in the way of being able to actually create PFA using uh, the JVM, and in particular for Scala for Spark. Uh, our group created uh, a project called Artvark, which is PFA export for Spark ML models. Uh, and a couple of other projects, Woken, from, um, uh, which is for PFA export and validation, and Salesforce actually in their, um, in their auto AI library for Spark called Transmogrify, uses PFA uh, for scoring and in fact uses the Artvark library for exporting their models from SparkML. So also to walk through a, a concrete use case where PFA was used, um, this is the Human Brain Project um, out of uh, Switzerland by a, a gentleman, Lulovic uh, Claude, who we, uh, Svetlana and myself have worked with um, before. and. This is a network of hospitals that need to each do uh, updates of a model or various models locally in their own hospital, effectively federated learning. Um, they're saving those, those model exports uh, and the models that they want to share as PFA. And then those uh, PFA models are then shared with other hospitals that are able to actually um, analyze and benchmark and then use models um, in a, in, a, in new diagnostics and to help new patients. And this is all done um, using PFA as an interchange standard, um, as well as applying federated learning and, and, and privacy techniques um, for sensitive medical data. So the current status of, of PFA, as I mentioned, there, there are reference implementations, including Hadrian. PFA is, is the, the parts that it does well are effectively the parts that are uh, very similar to programming languages. So because it tries to be a, a, most a mini programming language, it gives a high degree of flexibility um, and a, the type system and control flow, user-defined functions will allow you to do, to do uh, all, almost any analytic uh, application or feature transform or model that you can think of, including stateful operations. Uh, so you can actually um, create an update state um, and and access uh, external data uh, sources and databases uh, as part of the PFA standard. It has good support for traditional machine learning um, models and operations, but however, there are some, some missing features. The most critical of these is the lack of deep learning support. So there's, there's some basic support for your standard vectors um, and your, your standard linear algebra on, on uh, single dimensional vectors and, and two dimensional uh, matrices. But there's no deep learning related operators like convolutions, uh, LSTMs, and other recurrent neural networks, um, and no tensor support for higher dimensions. Um, and finally, there are some open questions around how performant and scalable both the scoring engine and the, and the PFA spec itself is for very large models. Uh, and we have seen some industry usage and adoption, as you saw, but really uh, at the moment, the question is, is, is there enough critical mass for PFA to, you know, to really continue and grow? So we mentioned deep learning, and that's obviously a, a, a very uh, important topic at the moment and has seen a, a huge resurgence in recent years. Um, and the final uh, model standard that we'll look at is highly related to deep learning, and it's called the Open Neural Network Exchange, or ONIX. And as you saw, a prol proliferation of uh, deep learning frameworks in the recent years um, has really led to each of them doing uh, very different things in terms of being able to represent and serialize and export their models. And to help solve this problem, Onyx was created um, originally by Facebook and Microsoft in around se September 2017. Um, and the idea is to provide a, a standard format for exporting and representing uh, deep learning computation graphs. So effectively an intermediate representation for these computation graphs. It's based on protocol buffers, um, predominantly for efficiency, and it covers mostly deep learning, which is its focus, but as we'll see a little bit of traditional machine learning too. Uh, 
and it has grown very significantly to be used and worked on by many, many companies. And at the recent community uh, meet meeting for Onyx, uh, we can see that some usage uh, and engagement statistics were presented um, showing over the last year significant growth across the board. So a lot of GitHub stars and GitHub forks indicating um, you know, usage of the project, you published papers you being used in research, new models added to the model zoo, um, and a lot more you know, 20 percent higher level of contributors uh, and, and 10 percent higher or 11 percent higher pull requests so it's a very active community a lot of different companies large and small ranging from you know, facebook microsoft um, aws uh, ibm intel nvidia all the way down to, uh, to to startups in the deep learning uh, deep learning space so very active and, and widespread community the deep learning uh, frameworks uh, typically represent computation as a, as, a, as a computation graph. And we'll see an example on the left of a, of a graph here. So the graph represents um, the, the nodes in the graph are, are inputs uh, and operations. And as we see the, here, the green box represents an operation um, and the, the blue circles represent inputs and outputs. So this is a matrix multiplication and it takes an input X and, and Y and it performs a matrix multiplication operation to provide, you know, to give a matrix output Z. And the, the simplified protocol buffer representation of that is shown on the right, where um, the top level object in, a, in, an Onyx, um, in an Onyx graph, Onyx protocol buffer is this graph object. And the graph is made up of, of a set of nodes. And the node, as we can see, specifies the inputs, the outputs, its name, and what the operation is. Um, and then the actual um, inputs and outputs to the graph are specified as, as types, where the type is typically a, um, a kind of primitive type, such as a, a number or a string, Boolean. Uh, and the, the main kind of first class citizen within Onyx is, is, a, is an arbitrary dimension tensor. So it's built from the ground up to support um, one, two, three, four D, whatever dimensional tensors are required for, uh, for deep learning. Because its focus is on deep learning, there's a strong support within the deep learning frameworks. It's actually baked into PyTorch Cafe 2, um, as from version 1, uh, strong support for TensorFlow. Um, in fact, IBM Research has played a, a role in uh, creating the converter there. Keras, Apple Core ML, MXNet, uh, Cognitive Toolkit from Microsoft, and many, many more. Now, even deep learning models actually need to do some pre-processing, um, and, and of course, your traditional feature, uh, traditional machine learning pipelines typically uh, involve a lot of feature engineering. So, to to address this part, um, a part of the spec was created called Onyx ML, and this prov provides some support for traditional machine learning. So, it adds two additional types, uh, sequences, and probably most importantly, maps. So, it allows you know, mappings, for example, from strings to integers or integers to strings, which are useful for doing things like um, categorical feature and string uh, and text encoding, one-hot encoding, and so on. And then it adds specific operators for traditional machine learning, including vectorizers for dealing with numeric and string data, one-hot encoding and label encoding for categorical features, uh, scaling, normalization, and, and scaling uh, numerical feature vectors, as well as your uh, some of your, your kind of standard models, linear models, uh, support vector machines, trees, and ensembles of trees. So the exporter library for Onyx ML has also uh, grown and is very active. Uh, the most, uh, most popular and, and active of these are for scikit-learn, where over 60 operations or components within scikit-learn are supported. Light GBM and XGBoost, very popular uh, gradient boosting libraries. Apache Spark ML supports over 25 components. Uh, Keras, all layers, and within Keras, as well as anything that is a TF custom layer that uh, is supported by the TF uh, TensorFlow converter for Onyx, is also itself supported. The best VM, Apple Core ML, um, and some others. So there's, there's pretty good uh, support in the exporter community, although, of course, you know, there's, there's always a lot of work still to be done. So if we look at the Onyx ecosystem, we have the converter ecosystem for uh, taking all of these frameworks and converting them into Onyx. We have the Onyx spec um, and a bunch of model zoo, models in the model zoo represented as Onyx. 
And then we have the single stack at the moment, which is the Onyx runtime, uh, also an open source project for Microsoft, uh, tools for network visualization, and many other runtimes that, that support Onyx, uh, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, and the deep learning libraries, as well as uh, various um, accelerated libraries from providers such as Intel and NVIDIA um, for doing you know, computation on edge devices or specific hardware. Uh, so finally, for Onyx, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. It's a very active community. Um, Onyx ML is, is still fairly uh, fairly new, and, and there's a plenty of new operators and functions that would need to be created. The converter ecosystem has good coverage, but there's a lot of work that could be done, for example, in Spark, um, which only supports Python currently. Uh, performance testing of Onyx versus PFA and M PMML, and, uh, and as well as the native libraries. Uh, so comparing all of these standards that we've discussed today. Uh, Svetlana, in fact, has been uh, running the, uh, leading a training working group within Onyx, adding uh, the ability to train models to Onyx. So there's a lot going on and a lot of interesting work to be done in the future. So I'll hand back over to Svetlana to, uh, to wrap up with a comparison of, um, between all of these three standards that we've discussed. Thank you, Nick. So let's uh, compare and contrast various parts of uh, those two of those three standards. Uh, first of all, about the format. Well, uh, PML is using XML and PFA is using JSON and YAML. Uh, those are human readable formats, uh, which is very good for uh, model uh, transparency and helps to improve uh, best practices in model creation. Uh, PML is very good in uh, containing all the model metadata. PFA has some of it, and Onyx doesn't really have much metadata in it. Uh, model quality information is also very useful for model interpretation and visualization, and that is presented very good, very well in PML, but not as well in PFA and Onyx. In terms of larger model support, of course, Onyx is the best because uh, it's a binary format, so a larger size of the model is not a problem for it. And in terms of model visualization, uh, well, as I said, the PML has this model quality information, which is helpful. And uh, Onyx has uh, various uh, open source uh, visualizers for the model, which is also very helpful. And uh, in terms of feature pre-processing, uh, PML and PFA and Onyx all have pretty good support for that. But in terms of string processing, uh, PML and PFA are pretty good, while Onyx is not as, as good as uh, could be. And there, there is a room for improvement for Onyx. And uh, say, uh, with categorical feature encoding, it's more or less OK. Uh, of course, for image processing, Onyx is the only one that uh, can currently deal with it. Although in PML, for next release, we are discussing adding some support for image processing with deep learning, but that will be a while before it becomes a standard. And in terms of uh, custom transformations, we do have uh, built-in functions, uh, very flexible both in PML and PFA, but Onyx does not have those yet. Uh, and in terms of models themselves, uh, well, many traditional machine learning models are well represented in all three standards, uh, while some, um, such as time series, uh, may, be, may present problems for PFA and especially for Onyx. And of course, for deep learning, only Onyx is good so far. And um, in terms of community, that's where Onyx is shining. So we do have the data mine group, which is a group of companies. It's kind of open governance, but uh, a company needs to be a member of the data mine group and pay some fees to actually work on the PML and PFA, while Onyx is uh, totally open, is part of Linux Foundation AI, and uh, has a huge community, as we just saw in previous slides. And again, there is a very large active developer community for Onyx and smaller communities for the other standards. And uh, converter ecosystems, well, for PML, there is a lot of converters for all kinds of uh, systems. And uh, for Onyx, there is even more. For PFA, I'm not so sure. Finally, how can you contribute to those open standards? Well, for PML, we have this issue tracking system called uh, 
that's the website mantis.dmg.org and uh, I invite you to check it out. You can create new issues if you find problems with PML and you can help to work on existing issues. Uh, for PFA right now, I'm not sure even how to contribute because uh, we haven't had PFA meetings and DMG for a while. But for Onyx, if you go to its main web page on onnx.ai, you can find all the information there. And there is a big uh, Onyx repository on GitHub and many open issues there. So you can go and look uh, at them. And I think maybe if we want to make Onyx ML more widely used, uh, perhaps we want to create an open source transformer from PML to Onyx and maybe from PFA to Onyx as well. So that would be a new open source project, which if you are interested in doing it, uh, let's get in touch and discuss how we can do it. Well, with that, uh, I will conclude with showing you some of the links uh, that you can use, uh, you can find useful. And uh, please uh, get in touch with us if you have any questions. And uh, thank you. Have a nice day.